why would an orthopedic surgeon uh, get involved with low carbohydrate uh, eating? And uh, in fact, there's two of us here, Gary Fetke and myself. Um, today, I'm going to change pace a little bit and, and talk to you about why I got involved. You can find uh, lectures that I've given on the science of low carb uh, on YouTube, um, on Low Carb Down Under, and on our website, thelowcarbdoctors.com.au. But today, I'm not actually going to talk about the science which has been beautifully covered by other people. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about knees mainly, which is most of what I do. So we'll go through the anatomy, biomechanics, arthritis, and you'll have to bear with me. You need to learn a little bit about the basic science before we can get into the interesting stuff. Uh, but I promise it does get more interesting for the low-carb community as we go through. Particularly, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about bariatric surgery and then some weight loss options. So the shiny white stuff on the end of your bones is the joint lining or articular cartilage. This doesn't have a blood supply, it can't heal itself, and it has to last you your entire lifetime. Once you damage it, there's no going back. There aren't any nerve endings in this, and so damaging your articular cartilage doesn't actually cause pain. The pain comes later, and, and we'll come back to why that's important. This is a picture of articular cartilage, and really the only two zones you really need to um, take any, any notice of are the very top thin zone, which is a very friction-free surface. It's got, like getting two pieces of wet ice and rubbing them up against each other. Now that's why the joint works so well. And the more vertical zone, uh, which is where the shock absorption uh, takes place. So uh, on the left we see a young normal cartilage, shiny and white, and we see there's a very thick red zone for shock absorption. As you get older, the whiteness goes out, and we've already heard in the other, a couple of talks why that, that happens in terms of the browning reaction, and you see your shock absorption layer gets less as you get older. Your friction-free layer doesn't change too much. As you start to get arthritis, you'll see that the red layer changes significantly, so you've got less shock absorption. You start to get interference with that surface layer, which uh, gets more water into it. And as a reaction, look at the bottom where you see the greeny blue bone, that's getting thickened as a reaction to the stress. So don't worry too much about the detail on the slide. What I really want you to notice towards the left of the slide are those little red dots. Now we've heard about AGEs a couple of times today, the glycated end products, and these are found in joint cartilage as well. And these AGEs lead to damage in joint cartilage. When your blood sugar goes too high or for too long, it can interfere with the joint cartilage as well, and then we see a progressive deterioration in the joint cartilage. So this glycation end product is a very important step, and so I'll just emphasize it one more time. It doesn't just affect the cartilage, it affects the tendons and makes them stiffer. So this is also seen in meniscus tear. So why do people all of a sudden at the age of 30 start injuring their knee more with sport? It's because the meniscus is less elastic, it doesn't move out of the way as easily, and so it's more likely to tear. So here we see um, a picture of an arthritic knee with uh, lots of lumps and bumps. It's no longer friction-free and smooth. As you get more AGEs, the extracellular matrix breaks down, and eventually you get exposure of bone. But you also get release of these things called MMPs. And MMPs are not released very much by a healthy liver, but a diseased liver releases a lot of MMPs because of excess carbohydrates, and they also contribute to articular cartilage breakdown. And what you don't want to do is move from the left to the right of the slide with your articular cartilage, which has to last you a lifetime. So what are the causes of arthritis? Well, genetic, metabolic, hormonal, I won't read them out to you. So really what it means is you've got to pick your parents very carefully. <laughs> so, Failing that, there's actually not that many of them that we can change, but one we can change is mechanical stress. And we see here where this arrow is showing the bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, where the two bones are touching each other, where the person has lost their meniscus and their articular cartilage. 
And when the bone becomes involved, that's when you get pain, because bone has pressure receptors. And if anyone knows anyone with arthritis, they can usually tell you when the weather's about to change, because as the weather changes, the barometric pressure changes, and you feel that pressure change within your bone. So this, for those of you who are squeamish, close your eyes quickly, all right? <laughs> This, this is what we're hoping to avoid. We're hoping to avoid a knee replacement where we put this lump of metal and plastic in, which we see on the x-ray. I'll click that off quickly. So just coming back to the mechanical stresses on the bone, uh, this is what I really want to spend a bit of time talking to you about. So this is a gait cycle. The gait is broken up into the heel strike, flat foot, and then toe off, and then the swing through. And you'll notice that as the person walks, one leg's on the ground and the other leg's in the air. And to keep you up on one leg, there's a lot of muscle forces that have to hold up your whole body. And biomechanically, what this means, it's not just a one-to-one -one ratio. So your body weight correlates directly with your joint loads. The biomechanics tell us that two to three times your body weight goes through your tibiofemoral joint with each step you take. So if you are one kilogram overweight, that is multiplied two to three times at the knee. And it's worse with the patellofemoral joint, it's nearly six times greater at the patellofemoral joint. So what do we know about obesity and arthritis? And I'm really referring to more than a BMI of more than 30. And we all know that BMI is a blunt tool. There are lots of other uh, health figures. And you know, if you've got a, an enormous footballer with no body fat, he can still have a very high BMI. But even as a blunt tool, amongst people that are metabolically unwell and overweight, BMI is not an unreasonable thing to measure. So if you've got a BMI over 30, you're more than four times, you're four times more likely to have knee arthritis than somebody that has a normal BMI. For each five point increase in BMI, you have a 35% increased risk of knee arthritis. Now let's talk about the other way. This study was actually done in pounds, but I've converted into kilograms just to make it a little bit easier for us to understand. If you're overweight and you lose one kilogram of weight, that essentially means your knee loses four kilograms of weight each step you take. So if you walk a kilometre, your knees experience 5,200 kilograms less weight. If you lose 10 kilograms and then walk that one kilometre, each knee loses 52 tonnes of weight. Now, who wears a Fitbit and walks 10,000 steps a day? Lots of you. So we're all told we should walk 10,000 steps a day. If you walk 10,000 steps a day and you lose 10 kilograms in weight, you will have lost 400 tons through your knees that day. And this is why your body weight is so important for your knees. So it makes sense, but does weight loss actually help these patients? What does the science say? The science says yes, not surprisingly. So disability reduction can be predicted from weight loss. If you lose more than 5% of your body weight, you get a significant disability reduction, and it's even greater if you can get to 10%. And we all understand that intuitively that makes sense. What about older patients? Is it too late? Well, BMI more than 37, all levels of arthritis, from mild to advanced bone on both arthritis, this study showed that if you lose 10% of your body weight over about four months, 64% had a significant improvement in their symptoms. So it's never too late, either in terms of age or in terms of the stage of arthritis that you have. Now that study, this study actually isn't a low carb study. And there's plenty of evidence that the low carb people do even better than this. So any obese patient, whatever the level of knee damage, will benefit from a weight loss program. And there is strong evidence for recommending weight loss as the first choice of treatment. Let's say, now we decide to do a knee replacement on the obese patient and we, you know, for some reason they can't lose weight. Let's see what happens next. 
Let's compare a high BMI patient compared to a normal BMI patient with a total knee replacement. And these are all from meta-analyses. So they're group studies looking at lots and lots and lots of patients. Number one, your operation will take longer. Number two, your infection rate is higher. Number three, you're at more risk of complications around and after your operation. What about the outcomes? Well, there's a score that we give people, how much pain they have, how much they can walk, how much they can bend their knee, and really the higher the score, the better. If you're obese, you're gonna have a lower score. You're gonna get worse movement in your knee. You're gonna get more long-term complications, more short-term complications, and your knee surgery is likely to be redone more frequently. As well, your long-term outcome will be poorer. What about blood clots? Everyone's heard of blood clots. Well, blood clots make your leg painful and swollen and stop you moving. If you're obese, you're more likely to get a blood clot. Now, thankfully, you're not necessarily going to get more lung clots, which are the dangerous ones. So the death rate in these populations is about the same. What about if your BMI goes above 40? Well, you're at an even higher risk of infection and a significantly higher revision rate. Now, just to show you that this is not just one or two studies, here's another study looking at the same thing. You'll stay longer in hospital. You'll have longer operating time, procedure time. You're more likely to develop all-cause in-hospital complications. And hospitals are not a good place to be for if you, unless you're super, super sick. You're more likely to get a urinary tract infection. And fewer patients get, went straight home from hospital. A lot of them needed respite or help elsewhere. Just to re-emphasize the point, another large study looking at total knee replacement. Because of these factors, your odds ratio, which is basically a statistical way of trying to work out is it a significant amount or not, is, is nearly, you know, is somewhere between four and seven times higher for the risk of infection in an obese patient. And if you understand statistics, that's a really scary increase. Okay, so we do the knee replacement in the obese, obese patient. Does it last as long? Well, let's look at revision rates. Revision means having to redo the operation. A normal patient has about a 1.26% chance of having a revision surgery. BMI 30 to 35, 2.9%, more than double. You go above that, 3.8%. Above 40, 3.3%. So there's a massive increase in the likelihood your surgery will need to be redone. If your BMI is above 40 and you're male, you need to be even more worried. And we think it's because males tend to be a bit harder on their bodies than what the females are. But the patient comes and says, Doc, you've got to do my knee replacement so I can exercise and lose weight. And they push us really hard to do that. And that's what they believe with the current paradigm. So how do these people go after surgery? <laughs> well, again, another nice study. Obesity and physical activity, inactivity do not improve after the surgery. Total knee replacement does not result in decreased body weight. And, you know, we jokingly say it's because people can get to the fridge more easily. <laughs> but obesity and physical inactivity remain after total knee replacement. So that's not a good reason to do the surgery in these people. What about function? There's a five times increased complication and device failure within five years. More need for surgical revision. Functional abilities do improve if you do the operation, but not as high as if you do it in someone with a normal body weight. And SF36 is a, is a satisfaction score and a WOMAC is an arthritis score. They do get improvement, but not as much improvement as the other people. What about if you add diabetes to the obesity. Well, it's a, another risk factor for infection, and your complication rate is 10 to 30% if you have diabetes and obesity when you have your surgery. You get a lower post-total knee activity score, and, the, and you get poorer outcomes over three to five years. All right, so we know weight loss is good. And this is kind of scary. In 2016, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons Bariatric surgery prior to total knee replacement may reduce complications and costs for patients with morbid obesity. So we're surgeons, 
We know that we've sent people to Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, they're not losing weight. They've seen the dietitian, they're not losing weight. Well, what else can we do for them because we don't want to do a knee replacement? Well, okay, well maybe there's an operation that can help them. All of a sudden there's this explosion on the internet rec recommending and offering bariatric surgery at multiple centres. <coughs> so, does bariatric surgery actually help them lose weight? The short answer to that is yes. It does help them lose weight. The average weight across most of the studies was about 25 kilograms or a nine point improvement in BMI. And that will help them with their knee replacement and their arthritis. And this is studied a couple of times. However, they neglect to mention that many patients put the weight back on within about five years. And that's the problem because they don't change what they're eating. 220,000 adult, Ameri adult Americans have bariatric surgery annually. And the numbers in Australia are really you know, rapidly increasing. Are there any problems with bariatric surgery? Now, I'm not a bariatric surgeon, but I am a doctor and a scientist, and so I went to the literature to read about bariatric surgery. You know, if I'm going to recommend bariatric surgery to my patients and send them to someone, I need to know about it. So another meta-analysis, grouped studies. Complication rates of bariatric surgery, 10 to 17%. Reoperation rates, 7%. And I love this. Mortality associated with surgery is generally low. <laughs> so three in 10,000 people will die from this operation to lose weight. And that's really, in my opinion, an unacceptably high statistic. What about kidney stones? Well, 1.73% times increase following a particular type of bariatric surgery. Now, a lot of people blame keto diets for kidney stones, but they don't mention it after having had bariatric surgery. This is really scary. Five years after your bariatric surgery, your, your risk of suicide and self-harm increases, and it doesn't relate to the amount of weight loss. So you can be very successful with your weight loss, and you still have this risk of suicide and self-harm. What about diabetes? How durable is the diabetes remission? Well, this is fantastic. 72% experience type 2 diabetes remission two years after surgery. What about at 10 years? Well, only 36% now are still not diabetics. Change your food, it's long lasting. 68% experience complete diabetes remission within five years. 35% of them redeveloped it. Nothing like long-term follow-up to ruin your results. <laughs> so again, another study which basically showed the same thing. What about the real physical complications? Abdominal abscess, recurrent aspiration pneumonia, that's when stuff goes into your lungs. Um, and you can get all sorts of other physical problems. And these problems can develop almost regardless of which operation you have. You need to remember that these operations mostly are not reversible. So what happens in the long run? Well, you're at risk of getting micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin D, B12, calcium, iron. And the bariatric surgeons recommend monitoring yearly for the rest of your life to make sure that this doesn't happen to you. Every year for the rest of your life, you have gotta go back to them and they have gotta do blood tests and then give you supplements. And again, why would you do that when all you're trying to do is lose weight? Very busy slide, but this is again from the bariatric surgeons from a center of excellence, listing all the vitamin problems that you might have, which operation you might have, and how often you should be monitored looking for these deficiencies. So, remember the slide which I put up beforehand. Can I, in good conscience, as an orthopedic surgeon, recommend bariatric surgery to my patients? And this is where Paul and I got involved about three years ago. Um, 
I was faced with young patients who were overweight and I didn't want to do a knee replacement on them because I knew what the complication rate was. But I also knew that everything that I had you know, tried in the past had failed for these people. Paul was assisting me with uh, surgery and he and I were talking about it. My wife has been uh, low carb for a very long time and so I tested it out on my family. And my brother lost 40 kilograms comfortably. But my parents between them, if you add it up, lost about 20 kilograms. So we started trying it in the clinic, very small scale, and it worked. And the patients lost weight. And unfortunately for my surgical practice, they didn't need their operations. <laughs> it reduced their MMPs. Do you remember that MMP goes into the cartilage and damages it because their livers were healthier? They increased their omega-3 ratios, which meant they had less inflammation, and they had less glycation end products. There were a number of patients that lost weight and then within a year or two came back and said, look, the arthritis is still bad, I need my surgery. But those patients now are normal body weight, not diabetic, not on antihypertensive medications, and haven't had irreversible surgery, which, um, you know, they need lifelong monitoring forever afterwards. So I have to say, next time you uh, see or talk to someone considering bariatric surgery as the outcome for weight loss, and they're perhaps thinking about having some other surgery like a knee replacement operation, Paul and I can tell you, and the rest of the speakers can tell you, and I'm sure a lot of, us have, have, a lot of you have experienced this yourself, that this is a really easy way to change your lifestyle, to eat well, become healthier, and if you achieve the sort of body weight decreases that you see in the images of, uh, on the screen right now, you will see that your lifestyle will improve fantastically, and as we've heard from the other speakers, how much more enjoyable your life will be and how much longer you'll live. So um, I'd just like to uh, encourage you all to uh, enjoy this type of lifestyle and uh, understand why, as an orthopedic surgeon, I got involved in the first place. <laughs>